Does God the Father have a body? What does the Bible say? And does it matter? Well, we're going to be talking about that tonight. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope you all are doing well, and thank you for stopping by my channel. Uh, as you know, if you're familiar with my channel, you know that uh, my ministry focuses a lot on biblical scholarship and equipping believers with the knowledge and tools they need to understand the Bible better. I also love apologetics, knowing what we believe, why we believe it, and knowing how to answer objections from those who challenge our beliefs. And uh, because I am so passionate about the Bible and apologetics, that is why I am very excited uh, tonight to introduce you to my guest, uh, who is here to address uh, an idea that has been kind of making the rounds on the internet recently. And that is the idea that God the Father has a body. So my guest uh, tonight is here to explain why such a notion is unbiblical. Anthony Rogers, thank you so much for joining me on my channel. How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. It's an honor to have you on. Um, I've followed your ministry for a couple of years, and uh, I've been blessed by your videos, um, in particular, uh, the, your videos that you've done um, defending what I like to call Old Testament proto-Trinitarianism, um, defending the, the doctrine of the Trinity from the Old Testament. And uh, I've really been blessed by those. You do a lot of uh, great work in that area. Um, but before we get into the topic that we're going to be discussing, uh, some of my viewers might not know you. So uh, would you mind introducing yourself and what you do? Sure. I am vocationally a pastor. I spend most of my time as a minister going into prisons. So I was converted 30 years ago in 1993 as a troubled youth. I got into a lot of trouble in Southern California and found myself incarcerated. So in, in prison in 1993, when I was 18, somebody preached the gospel to me. I was overjoyed, couldn't believe that I could be forgiven and was forgiven. Amen. And so I immediately wanted to tell others. I got out a couple of years later. My offense wasn't that serious, legally speaking. And so from that day forward, I've wanted to go into prisons. And that required a lot of work on my part to get to where I needed to be. But eventually that happened in the Lord's good providence. I went through all the education necessary from completing my high school education, which I hadn't done mm -hmm. given my former waywardness, then a college education and then seminary, finally passing exams. And, and so now I serve in Southern California as the regional director for Metanoia Prison Ministries. Awesome. Uh, so I do a bunch of other things in connection with that. I love evangelism. And as you mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, you you mentioned that you love apologetics. I've always had a love for apologetics. And really, because of my love for evangelism, mm -hmm. I learned early on as I was proclaiming the gospel, people weren't as excited to receive it as I thought made sense. Uh, and they put up objections. So I started studying apologetics. So it was never driven by a desire to argue with people, even though in my pre-Christian days I loved to argue, it was driven by a desire to communicate the gospel of Christ. And uh, so uh, I have a love for apologetics. I've done that for almost 30 years, uh, engaging Muslims, Unitarians, and others. Amen. Well, that yeah, that's awesome. So what so what uh, degrees do you have? Uh, I'm, I'm in school right now, so I'm I'm just curious about that. So I received a degree in Christian thought from a Christian classical college. So even though all topics were addressed from a Christian perspective, they weren't strictly speaking Bible focused classes. So they, we were looking at economics, politics, philosophy, everything from a Christian perspective, but all that was preparatory to going to seminary, which was my real desire. Mm -hmm. Most seminaries require you to have prior education so that they don't have to teach you remedial things. If you're going to learn biblical languages, for example, they don't want to have to teach you basic English. So I did that. And it was hard because at that point, my desire was simply to learn the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And I didn't so much have an interest in some of the other stuff, although I came to enjoy it. But uh, then I went on to seminary and got a divinity degree 
from Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. I've considered going on to get additional education. The only reason I haven't at this point is, for one, my time in school was usually difficult. I always had to work a lot outside of school, so I worked full-time. I was going to school full-time. And in those days, my kids were younger, so it was it was a full yeah. plate. And, I, know, I know the struggle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, even though my kids are older now, the idea of returning back to some of that, uh, it still leaves a sour taste in my mouth. Uh, not to be misunderstood, the, the schooling aspect of it is is great. Mm-hmm. It, it's just all the you know stuff that you have to do along with that and keep things afloat. So there's a little bit of that holding me back, but also just wondering how necessary it is to what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I I can study academic works and other things to my heart's content apart from going to school. So I often think through how important is this to work that I'm doing. Currently, I go into the prisons. They don't care what degree I have. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do have thoughts of potentially teaching at a seminary down the road, and then it would be important to have a, a doctorate. So I'm still considering it. Awesome. Yeah, one one other question on on that note, a quick question. Which language was harder to learn, uh, Hebrew or Greek? So it it changed at times. Initially, I thought Hebrew was a breeze. We were mm-hmm. doing initial Hebrew study, but eventually it got more and more complicated. Mm-hmm. So I'd say probably your first semester of Hebrew would not be as hard as maybe the first semester of Greek. But at the end of the day, I, I think in terms of seminary education on languages, Greek quickly becomes more difficult. Mm-hmm. Although seminary is not an end of studying either language, and you can discover over time that Hebrew can become even more complicated than hmm. uh you might think so anyways the yeah i, I don't know how that came out exactly be, because uh, on the one hand it, it sort of switched back and forth for me at times i felt like hebrew was easier and then i thought greek was easier it just didn't seem to stay still all right <laughs> yeah i um i i uh took a, an introduction to language classes with which uh just gave gave an introduction to Hebrew and Greek. And then I took uh, two semesters of Greek, Greek, Greek one and two. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm wanting to wanting to get more into languages. Um, but yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for your perspective on that. I, um, I wanted to, to have you on to talk about a topic that's a little unique. It's not something that that I've heard a lot of people talk about, um, and that is the idea that God the Father has a body. Um, And this is not a topic that I really spent much time studying until recently, uh, really since I I saw your debate. And um, I didn't even know that anyone besides Mormons, I guess, uh, actually believed that God the Father has a body. Uh, but like I mentioned, uh, you recently participated in a debate with Sean Griffin on this topic. And uh, Sean is someone um, I, that I've debated uh, before in the past, and um, he has a, a lot of unusual beliefs. Uh, and, and this is one of them, and basically that Sean believes um, that God the Father does have a body. So uh, before we get into it, um, how did this debate between you and Sean come about? How, how did you... Uh, how did this event get set up where you're you're going to be debating Sean on on this topic of whether God has a body or not? Yeah, so truth be told, this isn't something I was interested in at first. Mm-hmm. I have a lot to do. I consider my time and the use of it important. There's a lot of stuff that I would rather be doing in in some respects. There's no end to my mind of the treasures to be found in Scripture. And anytime I think of sort of veering off from that, it, it, it has to be for some good reason. Mm-hmm. And so I, I saw a couple of things that Sean had done. And when I saw them, these were just brief clips. So, for example, he did a debate with Matt Slick 
And somebody sent me this clip and said, you have to see this. And in the clip, Sean said to Matt that God is spirit means that he is made of water and power. And Matt's response was the same as mine. I thought, what is this? I, I've never heard this, not even from Mormons. Mm -hmm. Not that it's far from them. He, he's mm -hmm. ascribing to God materiality and composition and so forth. But Mormons didn't usually say it that way. And, and, and it just, it seemed bizarre. Plus he didn't portray himself as a Mormon. So mm -hmm. I was thinking, where is he getting this idea? But when I heard that, I thought, yeah, not a world I want to get into. I, I'm going to ignore this. And then somebody sent me something else. It was another strange idea of his that the son as high priest is sacrificing animals in heaven. Mm -hmm. And the idea along with God having a body that he eats, that he goes to the bathroom. And when I was hearing this and then on top of it, noticing that he put these things out there, not only as true, but with an air of confidence uh, an overweening confidence and and even a a look on his face like uh, it's t it's totally obvious right yeah it's obvious yeah. and then looking down at the person as though they don't believe the bible mm -hmm. and and i felt like paul in athens and this has been my experience over the years whenever i've tried to avoid certain things uh, in in act 17 i'm alluding to the statement that paul as he was going around in athens was observing carefully inspecting, as the Greek indicates, their objects of worship. So he's looking at their idols, and it talks about his spirit being stirred or provoked. Now, Paul was there, and no doubt with a purpose, to evangelize. So it wasn't as if this needed to happen for Paul to evangelize, but all the more he's, he's stirred into action and begins to address the Greeks. Mm -hmm. And that results in him being invited to the Areopagus, where he has it out with the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, who, interestingly enough, were materialists. Yeah. They believed that God or the gods had bodies. And over and against this pagan philosophy, and I stress that because Sean likes to say it's paganism on the part of Christians to say God right. isn't a material being. But here's the great apostle, uh, stirred by their idolatry. And, and why do they have these idols representing their deities? Well, precisely because their deities are finite, and this is a legitimate way of representing these embodied gods. And so Paul, over and against that, declares the true God is the maker of heaven and earth, and from that he begins to draw out implications. He's not contained by any right. kind of temple that you could make for him. Just hearkening back to Solomon, right, in First Kings 8, when he's marveling, God has promised to be there, but Solomon knows this— can't limit God. He says the heavens, even the highest heavens cannot contain you how much less this house that I have built. So right. Paul makes that statement to the philosophers that God can't be contained in a temple. And then he says, in God, we live and move and have our being. He put us in our various situations so that we would seek him, even though he's not far from any one of us, Paul says. Mm-hmm. And then he goes on to say, you shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or anything uh, such as you're making your gods out of. And, and so I, I heard some of these things from Sean. They were absurd to me and wrong and blasphemous. They, they, they derogate from the majesty, the glory, the greatness of God. And this was disturbing to me. And then, of course, as I said, the the sort of air of confidence with which he would say them. And I thought, I, I can't avoid at least addressing Sean in a video. Now, I knew when I was about to do this that it could very well lead to a debate. I've done numerous debates over the years. I've had people that will seek me out to do a debate, and I've learned that in their minds, this was their way of trying to uh, get some kind of notoriety. Mm-hmm. I'm not making any great claim for myself, but at least in their minds, I was somebody that 
if they could get me in a debate and then best me or something like that, it would somehow catapult them. And so I, I thought if I address Sean, he, he's the sort of person that, you know, there are some people that I think are smart people that wouldn't debate partly because they don't want to look bad if they don't do well, even if they might do well. I'm just saying people mm -hmm. have that reticence. I don't think Sean knows how silly some of his views are. So I thought for sure this guy is going to see me commenting on this and he's going to want to debate. And and so I, I did it knowing that would probably happen. What I did was I addressed something he said in one of his debates about Irenaeus. He was trying to marshal Irenaeus as an advocate for his cause. And I thought, this is on top of everything. I mean, where, where does this end? Because uh, Irenaeus is, among other people, somebody that I've read, you know, from almost the beginning of my Christian life. I mean, and I'm not saying this because I think everything Irenaeus says is true. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything anybody says is all true. It's but it's it was outlandish that on this matter, he thought that Irenaeus was in, in favor of his position. In fact, immediately, one of the things that came to mind that I remember from Irenaeus is where he's answering the Gnostics. And he points out how the Gnostics interpreted the biblical text in a way so as to ridicule the God of the Bible that actually is Sean's position. And, and they, they argued, mm -hmm. well, if heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool, then what's going to happen to him when heaven and earth disappear? Because the scriptures say they will. So his throne and so where's he going to sit? Mm -hmm. And uh, Irenaeus responds to this, that you guys haven't understood the imagery at all. And, and so that was just one of many things. But yeah, so that's how it happened. I did a show and then he challenged me to debate that. And then while we were setting up that debate, he also... Or actually, I, I should back up. I actually jumped the gun here. So originally, the debate was supposed to be on the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And then because I had said some other things, we were going to debate the Trinity on a channel called Standing for Truth. And we still are on the 29th at the end of this month. But somebody else was a little put out. They wanted to have the debate on their channel. And so when they uh, addressed Sean, Sean said, I'm willing to do another debate with Anthony on whether God the Father has a body. Hmm. And so that's how that debate came about. And, and then we ended up doing it first. Awesome. Yeah, well, I thoroughly enjoyed the debate. <laughs> I, um, I've watched a lot of debates um, over the years. And uh, it... <sighs> I, I don't want to give anything away because I because I want my viewers to go watch this debate. In fact, uh, we're, we're not going to get too in depth uh, in, in this discussion. Um, uh, I, I just kind of want to get give people a taste uh, of what they can expect in the in the debate because uh, I I want to highly encourage everyone go watch the debate. I'll leave a, a link in the description. Uh, but yeah, it was um, it was not only entertaining. Uh, but, uh, like I said, I, I have not really studied this topic, uh, until I watched the debate. So it was uh, very informative. Um, and, uh, I, I really enjoyed, um, listening to, to your responses to Sean's objections and all of that. So, um, but yeah, uh, so definitely go watch the debate, everyone. It's, you, you won't regret it. it. It's, it's a wonderful debate. Um, I personally, I think it's about over, uh, after, uh, Anthony's opening statement. That's my personal opinion. Um, th that's how, uh, uh, it, it, well, let, let me ask you this real quick. Like, d did it seem like Sean just, in, in my opinion, from what it looked like, it seemed like Sean didn't even know what to say when it came to his rebuttal. Like at once it, once you gave your opening statement and then he got on and it didn't seem like he even addressed anything in your opening statement. He just it didn't even seem like he knew what to say. Um, right. I, I got that impression as I was listening to his rebuttal and I was thinking, I'll bet he's going to end sooner. And then it, it's, it even seemed like he was talking a little bit more without anything to say, right. even though he knew he wanted to stop. Now, at one point when I had an opportunity to speak, I didn't take my full time, but that was because there wasn't much to respond to after I said what I had to say. 
-hmm. And so, you know, in his case, it, it was cut short because he was without any real reputation. In my case, it's because, well, I have to have something to refute that, you know, right. So, yeah. I, and I felt that. And I wonder how, how much longer is he going to keep going? And then at another point in the debate, he went on for several minutes talking about the flat, his flat earth view. <laughs> right. And I thought this is, you know, and I didn't even address that. Uh, it wasn't, you know, my interest in, you know, that's not what we were there debating, but I could tell he, he was without anything to say at that point, And so decided to perhaps stir up his crowd by addressing that issue. Right. Yeah. It, it was, um, it was something to behold. Uh, I'll say that. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. Great debate. Uh, definitely recommend checking it out. And, um, and you, you did say that you have another debate with him coming up too, right at the end of the month on, yes. on the Trinity. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I'll be, be looking forward to that. Um, all right. So, um, I guess, uh, to kind of get into it, this topic, uh, why is this topic of God, the father's body important? Why does it matter? Why does it matter whether or not God has uh, a body in your opinion? Yeah. Well, number one, truth is important in the mm -hmm. Bible. God revealed his word to us so that we would know the truth. Jesus said in John 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Mm -hmm. Jesus identified himself as the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is throughout scripture, uh, it, you know, an important thing. It, it, and, uh, but all the more when it comes to God, there's nothing, I, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised sometimes when I've had people in fact, in response to this debate, some people left comments on my channel saying, why is this even important? And I, I realize that's probably why you're asking this, so that mm -hmm. people that might have that on their minds uh, will have something to you know, hang, hang their thoughts on. But uh, it, it's surprising to me how low a priority people put on what they think about God, but then they'll turn around and think it especially important whether you believe the earth is a globe or flat right. mm -hmm. you know so and, and you know i'm not even commenting here on on what the truth is there that's sort of irrelevant to me with respect to these sorts mm -hmm. of matters but uh, what's more important than god and and the old testament stresses the importance of having the true god so the first commandment of the decalogue you shall have no other gods before me, stated twice in case you missed it, Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, not to mention the other ways that it's expressed, you know, with some verbal variation. You have Deuteronomy 6, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, or at least that's the form it's it's given when it's cited in the New Testament. There's a there's an emphasis put on it in the New Testament uh, mm -hmm. where it adds a fourth thing. Uh, there's three listed in in Deuteronomy six, but and then you you have repeatedly in Scripture God condemning people for turning aside to the worship of false gods, mm -hmm. and it, it's not adequate that people refer to God and just mean whatever they want by that. Mm -hmm. the, the the pagans would say they believed in God, and they would ascribe to their God some of the same actions that the Bible ascribes to the true God, but at significant points, their gods varied from, from the true God. And those are among reasons why this is important. There's no, nothing and no one more important than God. It detracts from his honor and majesty to say something about him that falls short of, of the truth as he's given it. This is the way by which we know him and, and we worship him rightly. Uh, this is the means through which we're sanctified and a true knowledge of him. The list could go on and on. Amen. Very well said. Yeah, I, I often hear... Um, people say like, like when it comes to things like the Trinity, for example, like why, why do you, why do you care so much about the, the Trinity or the nature of God uh, or, you know, how that all works together. And, and you put it well, it's like, because 
I mean, it's God. <laughs> like nothing is more important than who God is. And we should seek to know God as he has revealed himself. And, and that's why it's, uh, you know, we ought to understand the Trinity, his triune nature. That's why we ought to understand the the son's deity um, and uh, and learn what scripture reveals about uh, God. And so um, uh, to kind of move on, um, this may be a little difficult for you, but I wanted to ask what you thought um, Sean's strongest point or argument is in support of his position. Um, so what is his, in your opinion, what is his strongest argument uh, or point that he makes to support the notion that God the Father has a body? And then after that, uh, maybe you could explain why it still fails. Yeah, so generally speaking, and then I'll, I'll try and get a little more specific. The Old Testament is shot through with references to God's face, his mm -hmm. eyes, his nose, his mouth, his hands, his feet. Now, I don't think that Sean even knows how much that's the case. And In fact, uh, there was so much I wish I could have brought up in the debate and, and would have brought up some additional things in the cross-examination period if he didn't put up so much resistance to the questions. He was very melodramatic, as people will see, and, and trying to give off the impression that I was somehow misbehaving, you know. But uh, in any case, the, uh, the the Old Testament text is shot through with, with references to anatomical features. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it even, uh, this is when I say that there's even more there than I think Sean knows. For example, it makes reference to God's long nostrils. So mm -hmm. most people wouldn't know that because it doesn't come through in our English translations. Precisely because the translator, somebody might claim they're wrong on this, but the it's translator slow to anger, it. right? Slow to yeah. anger. Yeah, slow to anger. It, yeah. It's it it's the phrase for being long of nostril. Now mm -hmm. they recognize that this is idiomatic. It's a way of talking about God's anger. Because part of the problem is what do you do if you render it literally in a text where it speaking to Moses, it talks about God turning away from his nostrils. Mm -hmm. How does God turn away from his nostrils? If these are literally nostrils that belong to him, then they're on his face and he's turning away, then they're turning with him. So you can't turn away from them. It has to be an idiom. And there are other indications of that sort of thing. Another example would be in Exodus 15, where it talks about Pharaoh and his armies being congealed in the heart of the sea at the blast of God's nostrils. Other places, it talks about uh, the smoke flaring up or fire shooting out of God's nostrils. And, and when you read the event, what's actually in view there, it, it doesn't involve literal fire consuming anybody. And so even that shows you that it, it's idiomatic. There, there's other things. Plus, the, the term nostrils is sometimes not only in the dual, but in the plural. So does God have three or more nostrils? Right. So I, I would say that there is a sense in which there's so much there that it could present a persuasive case for it. And this is what gives a lot of mileage to Mormons. I, I've mm -hmm. engaged Mormons a lot over the years, and they could throw a, the average Christian off pointing to these sorts of things. Uh, what, one other thing as an example would be the frequent references to God's arm. What's fascinating here to me is not only that this is idiomatic, but what the idiom ultimately ends up meaning. So, for example, in Exodus 15, it talks about God saving Israel by his arm, and they even glorify God's arm. You go into the Psalms, and it talks about God's arm uh, acting valiantly. Mm -hmm. And then you think, well, this is interesting. I initially, if you're thinking, and I think somewhat rightly, although I think there's more to this, uh, if you're thinking idiomatically, you're thinking it refers to God's power. Mm -hmm. But when you get into the Psalms and some other books, the, the arm of the Lord begins to be personified, almost spoken of as a person. Right. It gets all the more interesting when you get into the prophet Isaiah, mm -hmm. where he repeatedly talks about the arm of the Lord. It, he talks about the arm of the Lord descending it, he talks about how God looked and saw that there was no man, meaning mm -hmm. nobody who could interpose himself between God and a sinful people, mm -hmm. sort of like Moses did when he turned aside God's wrath, although not 
perfectly and completely, mm-hmm. right? Moses being a foreshadowing of Christ, he averts God's wrath on occasion. And you, you see in, in the prophet Isaiah where he's talking about God looking, there's no man, no, no Moses-like individual who can do this. So then it says his own arm wrought salvation for him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and so forth. So the arm of the Lord is portrayed as descending and taking up the responsibility of standing in the gap between God and his people. And then you get to Isaiah 52, and it says, the Lord has laid bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and by doing so, he brings salvation. And here's where it gets really good. This is Isaiah 52, the lead up to that great messianic prophecy, where it says, behold, my servant, he shall be high and lifted up, which is momentous in itself, because this is the language Isaiah used earlier for God in Isaiah 6. Right. I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on a throne, the train of his robe filled the temple, which is part of the case for saying that's a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, not the Father. Right. But then it goes on in Isaiah 53, talking about the Messiah, and it says, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground and so forth. So it's in effect identifying the arm of the Lord with the Messiah. And there are even early Jewish sources that do the same thing. It's not uh, idiosyncratic to Christians Mm -hmm. and it's certainly not idiosyncratic among Christians. Christians from ancient times recognize this Irenaeus included. Uh, So, uh, so, so, say, yeah, same with the word uh, of of uh, the Lord. You know, it's personified and and touches people and speaks to people and and right. Yes, and, mm-hmm. Yeah, and and so I, I would say generally, mm-hmm. there's this repeated use of terms for people that are, or excuse me, terms that are used for God that are also used for human beings. But then mm-hmm. on top of that, you have theophanic appearances. So it's n- not only the case that you have these statements about his eyes, his hands, his feet, but you have God actually appearing. And if think about this, if you if you begin with these sorts of texts and and then this is how you view God, then you have a problem trying to account for these other texts that speak of God in ways that go well beyond this and render this quite impossible. You have to simply deny these texts, skirt them, run around them, play with them, do whatever. But if you move in the other direction, if you begin with these texts that talk about the greatness of God, and then you see God appearing, well, now it's it's not a problem. You, you can easily see how this God is capable of doing this, right? Mm-hmm. This God who is so great, so grand, infinite, and so forth, is capable of revealing himself to people in history. So what Sean does, I think, is he begins with these texts that talk about acts of condescension on the part of God. I think about, uh, there are numerous statements in the Psalms. I don't remember how the English versions often do this, but the, the language there talks about God stooping to behold what's happening in heaven and earth, not because he's absent from the world, but the idea it, it's communicating his loftiness and his greatness and how small every created thing is compared to him. So that it's basically, it's sort of like, and this is a very poor illustration, but what else can we do? You know, uh, it, it's like when you think about a wealthy person, especially a royal person, it was often considered beneath them to fraternize with the lower classes. Mm-hmm. But and so in scripture, it's presenting God as the infinite, transcendent creator and Lord over heaven and earth, so that for him to even take notice of man is an incredible thought. Psalm 8, what is man that you're mindful of him? Right. In, in Isaiah, right. it talks about uh, the the nations of the earth being like a drop in the bucket and people being like whole nations being like grasshoppers before him. The idea is he's so great. How could he even care? But he does care. Right. So, uh, this, when you take this into hand and then look at these theophanies, yeah, it's a wonder to behold that God is appearing in these ways, sometimes very mundane ways. Uh, We kind of expect the Sinai type theophany, where the mountains ablaze and there's mm-hmm. thunderings and rumblings and so forth. 
but what about his appearance to Abraham? Right. Yeah. So uh, I would say that's among them. Now, being even more specific, I would say maybe you know the the, the texts, and these are the ones I've heard him appeal to most. Would be Daniel seven and Revelation four. That's why I preempted in my debate uh, uh, some remarks about them, where you have Daniel speaking about the ancient of days. Right. And Revelation 4 also speaking of one seated on the throne. And in both cases, it's obviously the father that the prophet or in the latter case, the apostle uh, they're, they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I, I won't. Well, I don't know if you want me to give my response now or let people see it in the debate. But uh, I, I would say in that case, well, the, the, the quick answer is those are visions. Right. There are visions and it's a colossal mistake to try and make everything that's being portrayed in a vision be construed literally. Uh, you, you know, Jesus has seven stars in his hand. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. OK, take that literally. Then he's fantastically large. Yeah. He's walking among seven golden lampstands. He has a sword that protrudes out of his mouth in Revelation 5. He's portrayed as a lamb as it had been slain. He's got seven horns, seven eyes. Uh, is that literal? Uh, I don't think so. Now, does it point us to something that's literal and true? Sure, but uh, mm. it, that is something that goes beyond the vision. It, it's it's right. you know, the, the vision is a way of communicating the idea, but the idea far exceeds it. Yeah, it, it seems like... It, at least my impression is that Sean is very selective with uh, the passages that he he appeals to to support this notion. And then when you and you you kind of did this in, in the debate is when you press him on this, like, well, what about these passages that portray God as small enough to wrestle with Jacob, but large enough that he holds the oceans in his hand, right? And and a, like is how big is God? And, and you, and basically I, you have to either be selective or you have to come up with some sort of ad hoc rationalization. I don't think he even answered that question, uh, but you have to come up with some sort of ad hoc rationalization, rationalization, I guess, um, to, to be able to explain that. Yeah. Now, if I could throw in here one thing real quick. Yeah. So there was some stuff I didn't get to, but remember in the debate, Sean speaks of God eating uh -huh. And going to the bathroom. Now, he he plays something of a game, it seems, in all the debates where he'll say something in one and then kind of act like maybe in the next or he won't be as definite sometimes, probably because he's worried about what might be coming down the pike. <laughs> and I think he could tell at times that he was being set up for a, a colossal fall. And, and this isn't something that somebody who has the truth has to worry about. You, mm -hmm. you know, Jesus was constantly put on the horns of a dilemma by the religious leaders, and he constantly bested them every time. He, he had, because he had the truth, he had the answer for them. So mm -hmm. if Sean believed and, and knew these things as well as he gives off sometimes, he wouldn't have had to sort of chuck and jive as I was asking questions, but one of the things I was going to ask, because I, I was thinking through this, you know, if your God eats, what does he eat? Well, he would say, because I've listened to him a little bit uh, more than I wanted to originally, but as much as I needed to, to prepare for the debate, he would say that the offerings that are being made are what he eats. So, so think about this because this indicates then something of the enormity of God's body. And this is problematic because, as you mentioned, as, as I pointed out in the debate, he wrestled with Jacob, which assumes mm -hmm. he's somewhat comparable in this appearance to Jacob, bodily you know, speaking. Uh, but then there are other texts where God is so much greater. He's you know, gathering the oceans in the hollow of his hand. But according to the law, there were daily sacrifices— right? Lambs a year old mm -hmm. were offered mm -hmm. twice. And and that's just scratching the surface. You look at Leviticus 1 through 7, there were all sorts of other offerings that were being given. And then on special occasions, 
there were an incredible number of things being offered up. So, uh, for example, I have it written down here. Second Chronicles 15 speaks of 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep being offered on one occasion. First Kings 8 speaks of 22,000 oxen and 122, or excuse me, 120,000 sheep. Now, if you just take away most of that and, and just look at, say, the, the the two sheep that are being offered daily and so forth, and you, you calculate it based on, you know, how, how much protein he would be getting and that sort of thing, uh, the, the figure comes out to, and again, remember, I'm just talking about the two daily lambs and, and just the minimal amount. He would be at least 36,000 pounds. Okay, <laughs> now. That doesn't, again, that doesn't account for the offering at the time of the consecration of the temple. Uh, you know, so I, I don't know what do you do with that. And then he's talking about God going to the bathroom. And I'm thinking, yeah, I don't know if you heard that. Well, you don't want me to get into too much. Let, let it be safe for the debate. But, I, you know, and I should say, too, for your listeners, mm -hmm. I consider this so ridiculous, so scandalous that I did mock it all the way through. Number one, because he's making a mockery of God, no matter yeah how pleasantly he tries to say it uh, he's dishonoring the living God and he's taking great offense at any opposition to him as though he's especially important and I'm thinking who are you to say these sorts of things about the living God and then be offended at the slightest idea that you're not as perfect in your conceptions and other things as, as you think and uh, but but it, it's worthy of mockery, and people should see it's not only wrong but absurd. Yeah, yeah, and I, that's that's the one consistent criticism. I I have not really seen any um, any response to the content uh, of what you presented. Uh, and I've looked. I, I read the YouTube comments. Like I said, I loved the debate, and so mm -hmm. I. I um, watched it again today to kind of uh, refresh my my memory. But I was like reading through the comments and stuff, and I did not see a single person. Uh, I don't, uh, at least there, there may have been some. I, I didn't see any uh, of anyone actually addressing the content of what you said. It was all just about how you were mean and how I'm like, well, that's irrelevant. I mean, you know, if like, even if you were mean, which I, I don't think you were, I mean, you, you both were interrupting each other, but you know, he, only one person's crying about it, but like, you know, if, even if you were mean that that's, that's irrelevant. Like, um, you know, what about the, what about the arguments? Yeah. So. And, and what, and what about the honor of God? You know, and, and this was part of the thing I, I was I, willing, I, I've been willing to do this on more than one occasion where, I know I'm going to end up looking like something of a bad guy, but right. at the end of the day, if people are confronted with the truth about God and that sticks in their mind and mm -hmm. I'm thought of as a meanie, but they still, every time they think about these things, when Sean's talking, they think about his God going to the outhouse uh, mm -hmm. or, or whatever it may be. I'm happy to to be whatever anybody wants to think about me so long as they can't you know get away from what I said about God and how absurd what Sean said about him is. Mm -hmm. you know so and I don't think I was being I mean and, and besides that, you know I, I and I said it in the debate, it, it obviously fell on some deaf ears, but I pointed out my methodology in that debate, I, I don't I, I make a distinction just like I think Christ and the apostles did mm -hmm. between the people I'm talking to. Unfortunately, in this case, there's other people overhearing it. And so they're not taking that into account per se. They're, they're thinking of themselves and right, whether or right. not I'm insulting their view or not. But in, in the gospels, Jesus doesn't address everybody the same. Mm -hmm. He addressed Nicodemus one way. You're the teacher of Israel. You don't know these things. Mm -hmm. uh, he addressed the Samaritan woman a certain way. He addressed the Jerusalemites in John eight, a certain way, mm -hmm. uh, Matthew 23, the religious leaders, it's not all the same. And, and my model in the debate was Elijah. E Elijah right. took the Baal worshipers to task. Now think about how mean Elijah was <laughs> on top of his mockery. What happened afterwards? All mm -hmm. of the Baal worshipers having been conclusively refuted were summarily executed according to the law of God. 
And in my view, uh, I get, uh, you know, I'm put out by Christians who have a different way of responding to this. God's law is holy, just, and good. And so when everyone thinks about those laws, you know, in relation to current societies, one thing no Christian can ever say is that it was anything other than perfectly just. So what Elijah did, or, you know, what, what fell out after it, the execution of the Baal worshipers was entirely just. Hmm. And so, you know, how mean am I? How mean am I? <laughs> I'm still alive and kicking. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it was interesting. I, I mean, that, it, it, I think it says something when, when all, when all your opponent has is, is complaining about, you know, your character or, or ad hominem, you know, attacks, I, I think it kind of says something about their, their position. Um, if that's what they have to resort to. And, um, so, uh, yeah, I, um, wanted to bring, bring this, uh, point up. Uh, so you kind of talked about how, um, you know, th there's all of these anatomical features um, th throughout the the Bible, and uh, a lot of them are are understood as idioms and things like that. And we and we just gotta look at what's going on and and in context. Uh, Sean did bring up a point um, that I kind of wanted to ask you about in uh, Matthew 18 uh, verse 10, where um, Jesus is explaining that uh, the the angels, uh, many people uh, view them as like guardian angels of of the the children, um, that they all, quote their angels, the children's angels, always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And so Sean brought this up to say like, oh, you know, Jesus is here on earth, and the angels. Um, he he brought this in. Um, he brought this point up. Um, against your point that no one has ever seen God, right? And so he's like, well, the angels, they always see his his face uh, in heaven. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to kind of get your take on that. Um, I, I kind of have been thinking uh, in that, in, in, from my perspective, it seems like he's sort of reading his own conclusion into the text here. Uh, he's assuming that, uh, he's he's assuming that god has a body and and therefore a literal face and so he he interprets this as uh as the angels literally seeing um the literal face and uh couldn't this be taken and and maybe i'm mistaken that's why i'm asking but couldn't this be taken as uh simply uh idiomatically that the angels always have access these angels are always have access to the father you know uh, on behalf of these little ones uh, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so one thing hermeneutically, so I you don't get to say everything in a debate, but it's underlying what I'm doing mm -hmm. when I'm answering. I, one of the things I'm doing is thinking in terms of what the whole of Scripture reveals. Right. So this is what some people would refer to as the analogy of Scripture. Mm hmm. So you, you, you already know when you approach certain texts, given what the Bible says, always, everywhere, some things are off the table in, in terms of what this could possibly mean. And I'll give an easy example. You know, suppose somebody wants to interpret a text to say, you shall worship idols. Hmm. I, I think everybody would know immediately that can't be what this text means, whatever that text is. That's just unconscionable in light of the whole of scripture. So what mm -hmm. are our options here? That's number one. And, and so just think in terms of Matthew's own theology, if God's face here is intended to say he's limited to a particular body in a particular place, how do you account for, and this is something I was sort of pushing Sean to do is mm -hmm. think about some of these other texts. Matthew five refers to the temple as God's dwelling place. Mm hmm. Matthew 23, Jesus speaks of him who dwells within, right? He's talking right. in the temple. Right. And so in Sean's view, and I, I don't disagree, he says God is in heaven. Well, by the same token, he's spoken of as being on earth. He's the God of heaven and earth. Right. Do not I fill heaven and earth, Jeremiah 23. So I, you can't take that to mean that God is limited to some particular body as a part of his essential deity. It's just off the table. 
the other thing is, and you've, you've got other things, by the way. Sean was playing hard to get there. He kept trying to monkey with the text and say, oh, it's talking about angels and so <laughs> right. forth. Right. <laughs> but, but besides that, there's, you know, the Father speaks at the Jordan. He speaks mm-hmm. at the Mount of Transfiguration. The Father's all over the place in Matthew's Gospel in, in all the places he shouldn't be since, for Sean, he's up in heaven. And besides that, I mean, Matthew speaks of God being in heaven right alongside of these statements about him being active in the ministry of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in, in Matthew 6, it talks about our Father who art in heaven. Right. Over and over again, he's in heaven, he's on earth, he's he's here, he's there, he, he, and he seems to be everywhere, the classical Christian conception. Uh-huh. But then secondly, Matthew says the same exact thing that John says. Mm-hmm. Matthew says in his own way, he's quoting Jesus, he's, Jesus said, Nobody knows the Son except the Father, nor does anybody know the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Mm-hmm. So the Son, and it's it's not limited to men there. There's, there's no qualifier like that. Mm-hmm. No one. He, the Son is the way by which God is known. He is the one whose special role is to reveal the Godhead. And John says it in his own way and pointedly John 1 18 after identifying Christ as the word which right. is among other things a way of saying he is the one who perfectly expresses the father mm-hmm. that's what words do they're the primary means by which people reveal themselves their thoughts their purposes their character and and so John calling Jesus the word says in verse 18 nobody has seen God at any time no one, right? Again, it's not qualified. Uh, no one. Mm-hmm. And the, the Greek is pointed. No one has seen God at any time. Mm-hmm. I, I keep saying the Greek as though I'm, the English is not clear enough, it, but that's, you know, it, it's right there in the text that there's no embellishment on the part of translators. It's it's comprehensive. And then it says, but God, the one and only or God, the only begotten who's at the father's side, he has revealed him. Then Jesus, later in the gospel, in John 6, says, you have never at any time seen the Father. And he's he's addressing the Jews not simply as those existing at that time, but as a people, right? It's sort of like Moses addressing people in Deuteronomy 5, saying, you know, God spoke to you from the mountain. This is a new generation of people, so Mm -hmm. he's treating them as a collective whole, so that what happened to their ancestors is just as true for them. And Jesus is saying, nobody, you've never seen him at any time. Later in John 14, Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And even prior to that, in John 12, Jesus says, he who sees me has seen the one who sent me. And so Christ is the one who reveals God. And and moreover, in that same chapter in John 12, I think this went over Sean's head, John explains the unbelief of at least the the religious leaders, the Jews in John's gospel, as I think you probably know, often mm-hmm. refers to the religious leadership in right. Judea, right? right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, because Jesus is identifying as a Jew, he's, you know, mm-hmm. John 4, salvation is of the Jews, and she repeatedly calls him a Jew. So he, there's a distinction often being made in John. And uh, they, they don't respond in faith to him, and even though he said the things that he said, and he's done miracles and so forth, and John begins to explain this, and he quotes two texts, Isaiah 53, Lord, who has believed our report, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed, which is about the Messiah, and then he quotes Isaiah 6, where the Lord said to Isaiah, go mm-hmm. to this people and say, you know, or be you ever hearing but never understanding, ever seeing but never perceiving, because the heart of this, you know, he's explaining their dullness, their spiritual condition, their inability, and, and therefore un- unresponsiveness. And then, and then, after quoting these two sections of Isaiah, John says, he said these things because he saw Christ's glory and spoke right. of him. Right. And when you go back to these texts, all the more interesting, both texts refer to the glory of the figure that's being spoken of. In, in Isaiah 6, it's the Lord. It, it uses the divine name there. Mm-hmm. The angels cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And in Isaiah 52 through 53, it's the Messiah. And I've already pointed out 
the, these are intertextually related. Isaiah right. fifty-two thirteen picks up the language of Isaiah six. So you already know from Isaiah that he thinks there's a connection between the, this figure and the one he saw in, in Isaiah six. But John tells you pointedly, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. So this is the one who reveals God. Now, whether the explanation I gave in the debate, which was this, mm-hmm. is is the best one or not, is kind of irrelevant in all the. I'm just you know, uh, here's what I said. I pointed out that Christ is not limited because he's God right. to his incarnate body. He is really and truly flesh. He took on a human nature, but his human nature is not to be confused with his divine nature. Mm-hmm. Both are his, and, and so we can speak of him as the son dying, but not by virtue of his eternal deity, but by virtue of the humanity he assumed. And so as God, Christ is everywhere. Hmm. He could say where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Matthew 28, Jesus said, uh, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Ephesians 1 speaks of him filling all in all. Colossians 1 talks about him upholding all things, right, right. by the word of his power. Hebrews 1, 3 says the same thing. He's being portrayed in the same way that the Father is, in terms of his deity, as infinite and and. uh on the one hand, he's uncontainable, but everything is, he contains everything. And so I don't find it impossible to explain that text in terms of Christ as manifesting the Father, even in heaven while he was on earth. Though mm-hmm. somebody may just want to say, as you said, mm-hmm. this is a figure of speech. Uh, face often just refers to presence, uh, and God can manifest his presence in various ways. Right. Uh, the. Uh, the Shekinah, the you know the kavod. The, there's other expressions in the Old Testament that talk about some palpable manifestation of God, which He's never limited to, even in those cases, right? But uh, so, uh, you know, I, in terms of the analogy of faith, it's it's off the table that God can be limited to a body. In terms of Matthew's own theology, hmm. God is everywhere. In terms of the specific statement of Jesus in Matthew. He's the one who reveals the Father. This is in agreement with John and other statements mm-hmm. in the New Testament where it's only the Son who reveals the Father. So for all those reasons and a dozen more, Sean's view to me is is out of court. Amen. Yeah, well explained. Yeah, you brought up the um, and you and you brought up this point in the debate too on in Matthew twenty three twenty one where Jesus talks about how God dwells in the temple, and when you asked Sean about that, um, I was astonished that he said, "Oh, well, that's it doesn't mean what it says. It's an angel. Like they, they no God is restricted to the the temple up in heaven. Uh, he's you know he's." So he can't be in, and and I mean, and I guess you would have to try to find a way to get around that, and, and that this is Sean's way of trying of getting around that to, you know, uh, on his view is to say, okay, well, there is an angel, but the text doesn't say that. It doesn't say that uh, an angel <laughs> dwelled in the temple. It says, uh, um, yeah, it, it yeah. yeah, he just makes stuff up. It's crazy. Yeah. So number one, there's the glaring fact that. He calls his ministry kingdom in context. Second, it's a mantra from his lips. It's not wrong for people to talk about context, but he mentions it all the time. I've learned, and and unfortunately, I, you know, too many people are taken in by this sort of thing. But just because somebody uses a term doesn't mean they're doing what they're talking about. He mm-hmm. he kept he he says context often. And what he's saying has nothing to do with the context. Yeah, it's in it's fact, just it's just contrived. Yeah, and and yeah. he makes no effort to prove it from the context. And, and so yeah. there are other people that, because he says it, they think, oh, well, okay, then you know, well, then that's that because context, yeah. right? And, but yeah, <laughs> so it doesn't say that. But then think about too the there there are crazy implications here when you think about first of all the whole of the Old Testament. Uh, revelation, the uh, religion of Israel and, and what they did. It was the presence of God among them that made them a special people. Take that away and what do you have? The, you know, so uh, I, I can't even imagine what this is that he's talking about. You know, the, yeah. In fact, think about 
Now, uh, in Exodus, there's the interesting account where the people, because Moses is gone for far too long, mm-hmm. right? God delivered them by a mighty hand and outstretched arm, and 40 days was enough for them to say, okay, we're doing something else, right? Mm-hmm. So they construct a golden calf and begin to worship it. The Lord is displeased with this. And because of that, he says he's not going to go up with the people anymore. Mm-hmm. And what does Moses say? That's okay? Yeah, just just send an angel, a created angel, right? We'll be okay with that. Mm-hmm. That'll be fine for us. No, Moses says, if you're not going to go up with us, then mm-hmm. what's the point, right? What's the point? And and so that, that's, you know, that's Sean. Sean. If Sean was there, he'd have said, oh, great, right? Great. An angel. Hey, you know. <laughs> We we don't need the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, we'll we'll deal with, you know, Raphael or whatever angel he thinks. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What one of the blessings of o- obedience, right? In Leviticus nineteen, was that that the Lord would walk among us. That and yeah. And anyway, uh, speaking of making stuff up, I have to uh, to digress a little bit. Um, I have to tell you a funny story. Um. There was, uh, I had a debate with Sean um, years ago on uh, the book of Enoch. He believes that um, the book of Enoch is scripture. And, uh, and so I disagree. And I brought up the point that uh, in uh, 1 Enoch 71, 14, Enoch is identified as the Messiah. And, uh, you know, it says, you are that son of man who was born for righteousness and, and righteousness dwells with you and, and all of that. And, um, and so you are that son of man and the son of man uh, figure is identified earlier uh, in, in the, that section of first Enoch, uh, the parables of Enoch as a messianic figure, a divine judge who, who comes and sits on God's throne, re- uh, receives worship. Um, ju- uh, salvation is found in his name and so forth, it, clearly a messianic figure. And so the book of Enoch presents uh, Enoch as the Messiah, which is kind of a problem if you're a Christian um, who believes in the New Testament. Um, and um, there is a, another point about this too, is that um, uh, an early translation of First Enoch 71.14 by R.H. Charles in um the early 1900 or um charles the, no no um charles R, or, yeah rh charles he's he's the he's the Charlesworth. i may, must have that recollection wrong yeah it, it's it's rh charles uh it's his ah. translation that is in uh the public domain so it's what uh what most people use um but he actually mistranslates that verse and it, he uh identifies the son of man as someone else uh he he uh uh, translates it into, um, you know, to say, this is the son of man, di- you know, directing Enoch to, to someone else instead of you are that son of man. Well, when you read R.H. Charles' commentary, he actually admits that he mistranslate, he, that he amended the text and he puts in the footnotes the correct translation, uh, which is you are that son of man. And so I brought up that point to Sean. I'm just like, even R.H. Charles, who translated it wrong to begin with, says in the footnotes of his translation that Enoch is the one being identified as the Son of Man figure according to the Ethiopic text. And his response to that was to say, oh, well, there is an Aramaic version of that passage that um, hasn't been found yet, and it probably says Mm -hmm. something different. I'm like, okay, so what are you arguing then? Are you arguing that the book of Enoch that we have today, which teaches a false Messiah should be considered scripture or a hypothetical version of first Enoch that no one has ever read should be considered scripture? What it, like, what exactly is the argument at that point? And yeah, but, but it, that's just a, another example of, you know, he, he just, when he's uh, presented with a point, it, you know, he has to kind of just come up with a contrived explanation that he doesn't have to prove in, in order to just kind of get away to, to get around the context uh, rather than, you know, interpret it within context. But anyway, yeah, that, that's, yeah. Uh, I'm still frustrated about that. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for uh, letting me uh, tell that story. Yeah. Uh, the Enoch came up in the debate. I, 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 you, uh, you know, I guess you, you mentioned seeing it a second time. Uh, but uh, that's another thing that gets me though, is where, you know, if I, for example, if I debate 
if I'm debating a Roman Catholic, a Roman Catholic would know they might bring up some apocryphal book or something like that, but they, they would know that it's not really going to be perceived by me as establishing the point. They might just mention it as sort of a, a backup point or something like that. But uh, Sean puts it out there as though, you know, I'm just supposed to accept and everybody else Enoch or something like that. Like it's, there's not even really debate here. This is just scripture. And in fact, one of the things that really gets me about it, you've probably heard him say it, he calls it the American canon. And I'm thinking <laughs> uh, every time I hear that, I'm like, what is this guy even talking about here? You know, even if you want to pretend that it belongs to some other canon or something like that, the Ethiopic canon. Uh, in fact, I caught him one time in a uh, chat section, somebody's video. This was after I had agreed to debate him, I think. And he kept talking about the Eastern Orthodox Church. And I said, the Ethiopic church is an oriental orthodox. So it's not even a part of that group, which is already a small sliver compared to, you know, you know, so uh, you've got the oriental orthodox and then a small smidgen of that, the Ethiopic church, and then not even in their canons do you find it always. Right. And it's hard to even tell in some of the places where it is found just what level of authority they give to it because. Yeah. You know, that th you could have these lists that would include things that are considered canon in a very loose way that, you know, like you could even find in some early Christians where they'll make mention of things and they'll say uh, they'll call it scripture in a sense. But then they'll say it's not scripture in the sense that it can be the mm -hmm. basis for doctrine, mm -hmm. but it's it's good writing. It's pious writing. It's edifying or something like that. Uh, so. Uh, but yeah, he, he throws it out there as though, you know, it's just Americans or something that reject it. I'm thinking, you know, it it has been rejected historically by the vast majority of everyone from yes. Jews to Christians to, you know, so. And, and even in even in the Ethiopian, they have multiple canons. And, and as you mentioned, it's included in some of them and excluded in others. And uh, even even in the ones that it's included, you know, there's some ambiguity about okay, well, how how uh, sacred uh, or what what exactly is the status uh, of these writings in their in their theology, and, and there's some ambiguity there. So it's already a very weak uh, point if you're going to appeal to the the Ethiopian uh, Christians. That, that reminds me of another thing where he he accused me when I made some comments against the book of Enoch of getting it from Wikipedia and you mentioned <laughs> yeah. Beckwith. Now I have read Beckwith. Mm -hmm. I can't honestly say whether I've read the Wikipedia article. There's always a possibility I read it, but I've read literature on the canon for years, decades. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm not claiming I'm the expert here or anything like that. I'm just saying that, you know, this isn't new to me and he's pretending that I'm off the cuff looking at stuff. But it was obvious to me at many points in the debate that he was looking at something like that because, for example, I quoted Mathetes at one point. I don't think mm -hmm. he really had a clue who that is. And he said, uh, <laughs> this is still funny to me, but he, he said, you know, Anthony's pretending like he knows the name of that guy, but he's anonymous. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, my lens, he's probably reading Wikipedia <laughs> which probably says we don't know who the author is. The fact is, because we don't know the name of the author, he's called Mathetes. That's not a way of saying, I know who this is. Uh -huh. It means disciple or learner, and they just use that as a placeholder for whoever he was. However, I do have an opinion, uh, at least to narrow, you know, narrow it down, because I've read scholarship on it, uh, mm -hmm. where you know, the, the strong case is between two people, Quadratus and Polycarp, I, you know, I've gone back and forth on them. I don't actually claim to know which one of those two, but I think it's a f good case that it's one of those two. Mm -hmm. But anyways, Sean was obviously, uh, oh, and by the way, so the the text of it that I'm, well, I've been familiar with the longest is in the uh, three uh, section set of church fathers that was put out decades ago. Uh, in there, he's called Mathetes. Mm -hmm. uh, other texts don't do that. They'll just say the epistle to Diognetus or something like that. So he's probably not familiar with that usage of it. He probably just knows of it through Wikipedia. 
And so anyways, he, he was accusing me of doing that. And uh, I, I really suspect that he was actually consulting Wikipedia during the debate. Yeah, that I, I, I remember that. That was, uh, yeah, that, that was pretty funny. Um, all right. So yeah, kind of, uh, I, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I, I know your time is valuable and, and I really appreciate you coming on. Um, but yeah, I uh, wanted to ask you a couple more questions um, to kind of wrap up here. Um, so um, Sean, Sean brought up this point in his opening statement, and um, and I think I think he kind of riffed off of this a little bit when you got into the cross exam. But he was um, th this kind of stood out to me, and I kind of wanted to get your. Um, uh, your reaction to it. He's talking about, um, I, I guess how God wears clothes. He, he quoted some, uh, quoted some passage about God's robes or whatever. And then he said, quote, he, uh, God abides by the same laws that he gave mankind to abide by, which was to cover your shame, hence clothing. This is why he gave clothing to mankind. Uh, so he abides by the same laws in heaven because he has the same body end quote. So when I heard him say this, there were a hundred thoughts that, mm. that immediately jumped in, in my mind. Um, you know, I, I have questions about, okay, Adam and Eve did not originally have clothes. Were they supposed to have clothes in the beginning before they sinned? Um, you know, and does God, was God eternally clothed? Um, what, so I, I just had all of these questions, but I, but I just kind of wanted to get your reaction to that, that, that God, he abides by the same laws that he gave mankind to abide by. And, and this is, this is why I guess we wear clothes. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, it, it's interesting. It wasn't until after the debate that I caught the last part of it where he mentions to cover one's shame. Uh -huh. I, if I caught that part, I probably would have made more of it. Does he seriously believe that God has shame that needs to be covered, number one. But what I did here was that first part where he says God abides by his own laws. Now, I do believe that the law is a reflection of God's character. Mm -hmm. The reason we're not to have any other gods is because there aren't any. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason we're not to worship him in an idolatrous fashion is because idols are lies. Mm -hmm. They're wind and vanity. They're not true. <laughs> They're contrary to the truth. And, and, and so uh, there's that. Uh, but uh, there's also a sense in which some things are uh, reflective of God's character, but as they apply to creatures in their creatureliness. And right. so there's a sense in which they just don't have any relevance to God's mode of existence, right? Uh, right. But we as his image bearers, you know, have certain conditions that uh, render that law and application to us taking mm -hmm. a certain form. Well, uh, but so I, yeah, I was thinking about this God following his own law. So he has a body, he wears clothes. And so he requires his people to be circumcised. He, mm -hmm. he that's why I asked him in the debate. I know you, you know, I'm taking away all the good stuff from the debate here. People are going to go hear it and be like, it's not going to be <laughs> as uh, jarring at first. But uh, so I'm immediately thinking, is God circumcised? And if so, who circumcised him? Because, because the law requires on the eighth day. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and then all the rest. I mean, if I had, it would have been even more of a nightmare if mm -hmm. I had two more weeks to think about this. <laughs> and Sean actually would answer questions instead of just pretending like I'm being mean. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, but um, yeah. And then he said in the debate, God has an eternally made body or whatever. And I thought, how do those two things go together? Eternal and made, right? And uh, you know, and and so he does say it's like a married bachelor. <laughs> yeah, and there's so many thoughts. I mean, you know, yeah. I, um, I, you know, I, I don't want to give away some of the ones I gave in the debate. I got to leave something for people. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, you know, where does it end? What are we to make of all this? Um, it, it's just it's crazy to me. And, and, uh, and, and in some sense, I don't even like thinking through it because it's such an insult to God. Mm. You know, it's kind of like I, there have been times over the years when I've become aware of certain things that people are engaged in 
you know, I've got a council, I got to do different things and, and, Mm -hmm. or being aware of what's happening in society or something like that. And, uh, there's stuff that I never would have even thought of apart from hearing what some people have done. And I often think, gosh, I would have been better for not knowing that I think. (laughs) And part of looking forward to the resurrection is thinking of God, just removing all that from my mind. Uh, there are some things that stick with me that I learned about certain people's lifestyles from 20 years ago mm-hmm. that I, I, you know, again, I think I would have never even thought of this, you know, much less ever done it. I would have never even conceived of this. And, and so it's because of Sean that I've had to think of some really absurd things. <laughs> yeah. And, and I fully expect mm-hmm. that he's got more coming down the pike because when people are sensational, you know, you, you, what do you do? 10 weeks from now when that's wearing off, you got to say something right. more sensational. And plus uh, one thing begets another. So even if he's not trying to crank out more crazy ideas, the last crazy idea will lead to another one sort of naturally when you begin to draw out its implications. Right. Yeah. My, my friend calls it, um, you know, not special enough syndrome, you know, you have to keep coming up with with uh, new ideas to to dazzle folks, and you know, keep those keep those hits coming. But uh, I all right, I had some other questions, but uh, I'll I'll kind of leave those because uh, because there were questions that uh, on topics that that already came up in the debate, and and you already talk about there. So I I, I would just re- refer people to the debate, check it out. Uh, you won't be disappointed. It's, uh, very informative, um, and, uh, very entertaining and, and yeah, so, um, I definitely recommend checking out the debate. Um, one other question though, really quick, uh, this was addressed in the debate, but I just kind of want to, want to get your take on it. Um, because this is Sean's big claim is uh, that the reason that Christians believe God the Father does not have a body is because of Gnostic influence in the church. That That's the reason we all don't believe God the Father has a body. So um, how would you respond to that, that idea that uh, it's because of Gnosticism that, that everyone disagrees with Sean? Yeah, number one, I made my entire case mm-hmm. from the Bible principally, meaning mm-hmm. this is the authoritative basis on which I was making all my statements. So he has to refute that mm-hmm. in order for this to even potentially be relevant. Mm-hmm. Then secondly, I pointed out that early Christians from the get-go were saying this, and they're saying it, the same people saying it are people who were opposing the Gnostics. Right. So Irenaeus most famously in his five books uh, against heresies, against the heresy of the Gnostics, advocates this. And and the Gnostics were the ones who said the God of the Old Testament is the Demiurge, not the right. true God, but he's, he's the God of the Old Testament. He's an embodied being. So even the Gnostics, you know, Sean thinks, okay, they're talking about this being, this ultimate being as an incorporeal something or other. Mm-hmm. And then there's all these emanations from that being. Uh, and and so if a Christian says that he believes God is incorporeal, he's being like the Gnostics. But according to the Gnostics, that's their God was not the God of the Old Testament. That God is embodied. So they read the Bible like Sean does. And Irenaeus right. comes against them, affirming God is incorporeal, invisible, infinite, and so mm-hmm. forth, timeless, impalpable, impassable, uses all the classical terms Christians use today. Uh, so he's clearly not a Gnostic, not getting it from the Gnostics, opposing the Gnostics. And there are people before this, you know, before Gnosticism was in full swing. Now, you know, we could talk about how soon Gnosticism comes on the scene. That could be relevant to how early some of these witnesses are in relation to it. But uh, typically, while people will talk about a kind of proto-Gnosticism even during the first century, right, right, it's not really in full swing until the second century and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's certainly uh, not earlier than First Kings 8. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's... absolutely, yeah. 
And, uh, you know, so there's, there's all that. And besides that, I mean, we go back to one of the problems and I see people doing this in a lot of areas. It's, it's fine and relevant when done a certain way to point out if some group that, you know, you're not supposed to like holds a certain view, but you have to do more than that because even groups that we know are wrong fundamentally can have true beliefs in their system. Mm hmm. Right. So, you know, Muslims will say there's one God. They mm -hmm. say Christ is the Messiah. They even call him the word of God. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't mean any of the things that we do by any of that. But mm -hmm. do we reject that there's one God, that Jesus is the Messiah and mm -hmm. so forth, because that's what they believe? They believe that God gave the Torah to Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, do we reject that because Muslims believe it? That, that's not adequate. You can't just say the Gnostics believe this, therefore it's not true. Right. right. You, you have to prove that it was something they believed, number one, and fundamentally in, in opposition to what the Old Testament and New Testament teach, and that it's based on erroneous principles or something. You know, it's not sufficient just to say. You know, right. Marcion believed in the gospel of Luke and the writings of Paul. So right, we right. reject Luke and Paul. Yeah. And, and before there, like, like, as you said, you would have to prove that Gnostics actually believe these things like that. They believe, you know, it, it seems that from the evidence that Gnostics actually are more in line with what Sean believes. Yeah. With so. respect to the God of the Old Testament and and yeah. one other point going back to earlier Pagans, pagans throughout the ancient world believed in embodied gods. Mm -hmm. That's why, and I don't know if you caught this. I, I, I think many people probably missed it, but I watched a video on Sean's channel where somebody, it's, it's something like God's bod or something like that. And to me, just the title's irreverent, you know, but uh, in the video, it's got these pictures and things like that. And in Sean's PowerPoint presentation, he's got this hand there that's supposed to be God's hand and other stuff. And I'm thinking, look, look, you, the evidence that your position is erroneous is right there in your PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. Your position leads you to making images of God. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I, I know that people who think God has a body will could claim, you, you know, that well, he just didn't want people making images of him, even though it was possible. Uh, but n my claim is that God doesn't have a body. That's why they're not supposed to represent him. And mm. none of the appearances that God took on temporarily actually corresponded to his infinite nature. And so they weren't fit to be represented, at, you know, because it, it would reduce him. And, right. uh, you know, but but Sean's position leads him quite naturally and without any pangs of conscience to making images of God. If that doesn't tell you there's something wrong here, that false theology leads to false practice. Yeah. He has no problem making pictures of his deity. Moses yeah. and the prophets certainly had a problem with that. Yep. Well, on that note, uh, Anthony, I, I really appreciate your time, brother. Uh, thank you so much for the work you do for the Lord, uh, your apologetics ministry, uh, your debates. Um, it's, it's a blessing to the body of Messiah. It's been a blessing to me personally. And uh, before, um, before we log off here, um, how can people connect with you and, uh, and, and, hear, and look at your work and stuff? Yeah, so I, I do have a YouTube page under my name, Anthony Rogers. I haven't thought of anything more fancy. I originally just had the channel to watch other channels and stuff. Uh -huh. and didn't really think at the time of using it to do more. Eventually did. And anyway, so the, the name is, is just under my name. I do all sorts of fun stuff. I talk about messianic prophecy I do debates here and there, do a lot of live shows. Uh, so yeah, they could check me out there and uh, see if anything catches their eye. And uh, that's that's probably it, unless they live in South Carolina. Uh, I'm, I'm around the state doing different things. Oh, well, I and, I, and I travel sometimes going going to conferences and speaking. Nice. So, so what part of South Carolina? I'm, I'm near Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, I live in the Greenville area. 
Oh, okay. Cool. All right. Well, um, yeah, well, we'll, we'll have to uh, talk more about that when we, when we log off here, but, um, Anthony, I definitely appreciate your time, brother again. And, uh, thank you for coming on and, uh, guys, uh, highly recommend Anthony's work. Go check out his channel and, and watch that debate. Uh, you guys will love it. And thank you for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Hey everyone. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to see more content like this, I want to invite you to subscribe to my channel. Also, don't forget to hit that little bell so that you'll be notified when new videos like this are released. One last thing, be sure to connect with me on my website, davidwilber.com. There, you can find a ton of free resources like articles and videos, learn more about the books that I've written, and subscribe to my newsletter to ensure you never miss an update. Again, thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you next time.